Um, and now I'm going to show you the video uh, that I mentioned that Ed took before. So uh, I think it was just last week, wasn't it, that Ed shot this um, in Woodland and Forest of Dean. Yeah, last, last Tuesday. <laughs> last Tuesday, there you go. Um, so it's a short video. I think it's five, six minutes long. Um, again, please do let me know if there's any issues with you hearing or seeing this. <laughs> Hi there, my name's Ed Druitt and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about woodland birds here and then also water birds at a different location. At this time of the year, if you're going out and about looking for or surveying for birds in woodlands like this, even if you haven't got a pair of binoculars, you'd be amazed actually at how flocks of birds can actually come quite close to this time of the year. Robins tend to have their own little sort of individual patches birds such as great tits, blue tits, long tailed tits will be going around in flocks and very often they'll come uh, quite close. Really what you want is a, a particular kind of transect or familiar walk that you might do through a particular section of woodland. As the leaves come off the trees a lot of birds actually become much more visible and you are listening for their sounds you can then look for them. So in a woodland like this you're listening, you're looking, spend a little bit of time trying to actually find the birds that perhaps you can hear and then what you can do is try and identify them. You want to be looking for key features. What do you notice about those birds? How big are they in relation to what's around them? Are there particular colours or patches of colour that you notice? And then also actually record them. And there's a variety of different ways of recording birds really, obviously writing them down on paper, but after that you can record them locally with your biological um, uh, records office for example. Uh, and also there's a fabulous online sort of recording portal called BirdTrack. But immediately I could see this very small black and white headed bird and then it was making these lovely little bell-like calls and it's just in this oak tree here. I think it's just moved on a bit now. And I think the key thing about trying to pick up and identify woodland birds really is suddenly being quick. Suddenly there might be something in front of you. You're listening for it. You're quickly looking for it. I haven't got my binoculars on with it at the moment. It's a nice bright day and when the bird was just in the lower branches of an oak tree behind us I was able to see exactly what it was. I'm in a different bit of woodland now actually and there's little birds just flitting around in front of me and that's exactly what you can do when you are in a woodland. Even if you don't know your birds very well, it's a gorgeous afternoon here in the woodland and actually just by standing here, as I say, I can hear a robin singing, I can hear some little goldfinches up high tinkling away and if I'm looking over to the oak tree over here I can just see a little coal tit for example just on a branch there. Colt it is quite a small tit with it doesn't have a bright yellow breast it has a much more sort of smoky pinky breast black and white head and I can see some other little birds just in the background there so really about woodland bird watching and bird surveying it's having a little bit more patience perhaps during the springtime you'll have bird song everywhere but during the winter time it's very very normal to have it quite patchy Now compared to a woodland environment where you're actually having to sort of listen and look for the birds and sometimes they can be quite difficult to see I'm down here now by a pond and the difference between water and of course there's a lot of water <laughs> throughout Warwickshire is that uh, a pond or a gravel pit, flooded gravel pit etc will often have ducks on it for example and some of those can actually be quite tame so for example just down here you may not be able to quite see them but there's some mallard ducks are kind of very common duck that we have in Britain just down here in front of me So really when it comes to surveying for birds during the winter time around a lake environment like this it is about maybe getting a more strategic position where you're not going to disturb the birds for example here they're used to people but where you can actually see a lot of the lake to be able to scan and identify and count those birds. Many places like for example Brandon Marsh there are hides where you can sit and you can look out across a watery space and you can then actually scan perhaps from left to right so you're not duplicating and double counting those birds. With my naked eyes down here there's some new swans. Just behind me here I've got some birds called coots, beautiful black birds with a big white beak. 
There's more mallard ducks in the background. I can hear a little grebe chattering away. Ducks with white panels on the side of their bodies, black plumage, all sat out on the water there. Some of them are sleeping. Those are tufted ducks. And many of those actually come to the Midlands and other parts of England um, from more northern parts of Europe to spend the winter here, for example. The lesser backpack gull there just flying around. So I hope that I've given you just a little bit of an overview there of watching, listening and surveying for birds in woodlands and also here in a wetland. All right, so hopefully that gave you a bit of a flavour uh, for things to come. Um, I will pass over to Ed now. Um, and he will give you some instructions as to cameras and mics and stuff, depending on, <laughs> on what he's going to do. Lovely. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, yeah, I don't know if it was your end. It was slightly kind of stuttery, that film, my end. But hopefully, hopefully got, got the gist of the, the, the situation there. But basically, I was in a woodland environment at this time of the year and really getting across that as the leaves are coming off the trees, uh, if you go on a regular walk, it's about listening actually. A lot of people think it's about bird looking but actually a lot of uh, bird watching or birding as we call it today really is about bird listening. It's listen for those birds and that first one that I heard in the woodland now I, I think um, I, I didn't hear myself say what it was but it was a great tip that actually just came into the tree and then on the woodlands uh, on the wetlands there really the great thing about wetlands is that they often guarantee birds even if they're not very very close so you can often be in a strategic position on a pond or a lake like that and and be able to survey the birds and i'm going to introduce myself a little bit more in a moment and then the idea really hopefully today is to give you lots of id tips on going out and watching birds and what have you but also about recording them and i want to sort of give you some tools today some different websites and places you can go to to both be able to record birds, to be able to find out more about surveying for them and how to get involved in surveying, but also how you can actually get some of this fabulous data that's out there and actually look at it as a table or a graph. Or if you're curious as to how your local great tits are doing in Warwickshire, you can go to the BCO website and actually look up a particular graph to, to see how they're doing in the West Midlands, for example. So we're going to look at that um, a little bit uh, throughout, throughout the today. So what I'm going to do first of all is just do a little bit of an introduction uh, about this evening and then I'm going to hand over to you um, to do something on a Padlet in a moment but we'll come to that just in a moment. So what I need to do is just share my screen. So let me do that. And let me just bring up my slideshow. There we go. So hopefully everyone can see. There we go got the front shot there um, of this lovely little bird actually this little bird this is our smallest bird that we have in Britain it's the gold crest a uh, very very small little bird loves feeding in conifer trees pine trees fir trees things like that holly trees and quite a common bird at this time of the year but often again you can hear it uh, calling and singing we'll talk about them a bit later <clears throat> so just a bit about myself really um, I've been, I was at university about just over 20 years ago now, and <clears throat> a lot of my career has been in education and learning, working with schools in particular, um, but also a range of different audiences, adults as well. Um, I've also done lots of education work for the University of Bristol, um, particularly in their teaching labs, helping with practicals, dissections, things like that, and also lots of things outdoors and helping students to get involved with schools and get experience and stuff like that. Um, these days I'm a freelance naturalist and learning advisor so I have the privilege of going out and showing people wildlife both here in Britain and also abroad um, but I still do a lot of learning work and sort of develop learning resources and things like that for people to um, for schools in particular and organizations working with schools to to actually use. I've also been studying urban peregrine falcons for the last 22 years as well um, Back in the late 90s, peregrines were just coming back into towns, or I say come back in, they were coming into towns and cities. Um, their numbers almost disappeared uh, completely in Britain back in the 1950s, and they recovered in the 1980s, and gradually now we've got them all over sort of central and southern England. 
And so I've written a book all about urban peregrines based on lots of new things that we were discovering about them over the last 20 years or so. And just in the last two months or so, I've had another book published, Raptor Prey Remains, um, which is to help people who maybe find a big kind of flurry of feathers on their lawn or are walking through a woodland and suddenly find feathers of, of a bird, for example, that's been eaten by something. Or if you're studying a bird of prey, um, then this book's got lots of photographs of sort of feathers and skulls and legs and bits and pieces of, of birds and things like that to help people identify them. So this is kind of like a lifetime work really of me identifying and looking at prey remains to, to identify basically what peregrine falcons eat. Um, and uh, peregrine falcons eat a whole range of different birds and they also hunt at night. So at this time of the year, particularly tonight, we've got a beautiful moonlit night. There'll be lots of birds, uh, birds called woodcock, little greaves, water rails coming here from mainland Europe at night. And the street lamps in our cities, including places like Warwick, get the light goes up into the night sky and it shines on these night migrants. And the peregrine falcons in cities can see those night migrants and catch them and bring them back in the middle of the night. So that's that's going to be happening in tonight, I imagine. It's quite a clear night out there already. So talking of migration, um, at the moment, there's lots of things going on. We've got lots of different things that have been leaving uh, the UK and we've got lots of things coming into Britain at the moment. And so what I want to do really is to think a bit more about um, auto -mig migrants and the sorts of things that we can see. This is just giving you a sort of flavour really with, um, with birds that are coming here. We've got birds that arrive here from, from uh, Iceland, for example, from Norway. And so there's lots of really exciting things going on at the moment. There's lots of birds called red wings, which are type of thrush that are arriving here from, from Sweden and Norway. So really this evening is going to be about talking about um, what birds we can sort of see maybe around the West Midlands at the moment and how to go about identifying a lot of them. And what um, by the end of this evening really I hope to have introduced you to a number of sort of woodland and wetland birds uh, in a way that gives you some tips of how to identify them both visually and, and hearing those birds. Um, but then to also know how to actually survey for them and hopefully along the way tonight also have a little bit of fun. Now there's quite a few on the webinar tonight so what I would like to do is rather than um, in, get everybody to introduce yourself I'd like to just know a little bit more about yourselves by you actually putting something on um, a Padlet that I've got and actually if you look at your notes um, or the, the uh, what's it called Deborah, the um, it's on the chats. Um, on the chats, that's it. <laughs> I'll, I'll re-put the link there as well. Yeah, if you have a look at the chats, you'll see that there's a Padlet link and it'll bring you up to what, hopefully what you can see in front of me, this kind of woodland scene. And what I'd love you to spend a few moments doing is just think about what's your favourite bird? When you go out and about, what, what is it you love to see or maybe hear? But also particularly useful for me tonight, what do you find most challenging? If you think about a woodland or maybe a watery habitat you go to, um, or maybe, maybe some of you are complete starters and you don't know anything about birds, it would just be really nice to get a little bit of a flavour of where you're kind of all starting at. So if you can just spend a, a few minutes um, clicking on that link, hopefully it's going to work for you all, and then go down to the bottom right hand corner to the plus sign and just um, if some of you can just have a little bit of a reflection, just think about what, what bird you really love to see. Mine's the blackbird. I grew up with blackbirds in my garden and I just love hearing and seeing them. Um, but it will also be really good to know what you find challenging, just so that I can think a little bit about if I need to focus on in a certain direction tonight. So I can see different things suddenly appearing all at once. <laughs> <laughs> I think often our favourite birds are things that we have an association with, like someone talking about the red kite there from the Chilterns. Brilliant. So lots of favourite birds there. And if you can also just write about ones you find challenging as well, just so I can get a little bit of a flavour of... Lovely, nice variety of different favourite birds there. Robin, Robin in there, the red kite as well. most challenging waders. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of them, aren't there? Let's just move my thing around. Lovely. I like teal. I can see one of you's got your favourite um, duck as a teal duck. And I, I've been very lucky enough to ring teal and they literally can sit in the palm of your hand. That's how small they are. 
They're really dinky little little ducks. <clears throat> Brilliant. So finding calls difficult. Pigeons and doves, corvids, all the crows and things like that. Okay, some really nice nice things coming up here. White-tailed eagle in sky. Goals and waders are most challenging. So I'll certainly be able to cover some wading birds tonight. Um, and with the goals um, for one of you, I can direct you to a particular um, sort of video that, that may help with that. And hopefully some of you actually may visit some of the links that um, Debbie sent beforehand as well. And those links will be relevant after today's um, sort of webinar as well. All right, I think most people have done, most people, are, yes, yellow wagtails are lovely, aren't they? Very bright yellow birds, brilliant. So we've got a bit about calls there. Um, and sounds. And actually bird sounds is something I specialize in. So in the springtime, I take people out and I help people listen because often the thing with bird sounds very often is that it's, it's about actually trying to help people to zone in because very often people aren't aware of bird sounds around them and so sometimes actually it's about just when I'm talking to people I'm half listening to people I can hear what people are saying to me I'm, I'm responding appropriately but I can also hear what's kind of going on behind me a bit like a newsreader where they've got an earpiece and they're talking to you as the viewer but they can still hear that what the producer or the director is saying in, in, in their earpiece. Brilliant. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for those of you who have, who have put something on there. That's really, really useful and really nice to, to see. So let's just go back to my presentation. And let's go back to from the current slide there. So some of you have, have talked about wading birds, and I hope to sort of come to wading birds a bit later. But this hopefully this slide here is just showing you some of the remarkable journeys that birds do make at this time of the year. And I'm going to come to sort of the Midlands in a minute and Brandon Marsh but basically around where you guys are across Warwickshire there's lots and lots of wetlands and so there's birds like snipe down here which is this long beak they breed for example in bogs and marshes all over Poland and uh, Finland what have you they come to the, the Midlands to, to winter we've got curlews that, that come down from Finland and Norway and Sweden we've got purple sandpipers up here that arrive more on the coast um, from Spitsbergen where polar bears live and then we get things like red shanks, um, which also may be quite coastal, but some of them will come through the Midlands, uh, migrating on their way um, south. And some of these birds will pass through. So if any of you, um, I've been to, been lucky enough to go to sort of Spain and Portugal in, in, in October, early November time. And there's quite a lot of wetlands around southern Portugal and Spain. And wintering there will be red shanks and ring plovers and godwits have actually passed through Britain on their way south and we know they've passed through Britain because often they are what we call colour ring they've got tags on their legs and you can read those tags or the colour rings in the field report those through the BTO the British Trust for Lithology and actually find out where these birds have actually come from it's really neat so here's a map of Brandon Mars Nature Reserve which some of you may have been to but even if you haven't the key thing is that Warwickshire and the surrounding counties are, are full of water. There's lots of gravel pits that are flooded, there are lots of rivers, there's the uh, Tame Valley for example um, and all these watery spaces are great places for a whole variety of ducks and wading birds but then also which is shown nicely on this map here you've got woodlands as well and woodland habitats alongside wetlands are just great places for a whole variety of wildlife and you may well be aware that, that a lot of our sort of wider agricultural kind of countryside doesn't have so much wildlife in it as it used to and woodlands and wetlands are, are, are perhaps better than the kind of agricultural countryside there's still declines of birds happening in these locations but certainly they are doing better than than those places so they're, they're good places basically to go to see and hear bird life and of course if you're just starting out or birds is kind of something you're wanting to develop this is the sort of scene you might be presented with you look out of a hide and you suddenly see lots of ducks but you don't quite know what they are um, and so hopefully this evening we'll just give you a little bit of inkling of the sorts of things to kind of be looking for when you are out about looking for birds 
Incidentally, we've got some cormorants here on the island and on the bench. Not really a bench, it's like a perch. We've got a couple of coots just in the foreground there. I've mentioned those in my video. These very rounded blackbirds with a white beak. And then just on the right hand side of the island, there we've got a little uh, a black headed gull there and a duck called uh, a shoveler. But equally, you can be in a hive looking at this sort of habitat, a reed bed habitat, and not see very much at all. There is bird life in those reed bed habitats often, but it's very hidden. And so often you're having to listen for those birds. You get a flock of geese, like these grey lag geese coming in and just wowing the whole kind of scenery as they're coming in. And again, another scene here where you've got lots of little birds that you might know what they are. There's lots of lapwings here in the foreground, a, a grey heron coming into land and some, and some geese in the background. So these are kind of the typical scenes that certainly in a wetland environment we might be, we might be presented with. And of course, not always at this, this, this kind of close distance, often a much further away. Well, let's go into the, the chats. And uh, if a few of you, this is, this is your classic kind of duck. So it'd be great if some of you can just write down in the chat what you think this 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 duck is. I'm not assuming that uh, um, I don't want to assume that all of you know what this is, but it'd be great just to see. And I just realised I can't actually see the chat, um, but Debbie might be able it. to <laughs> see it on my behalf. Um, okay, so, so what, they can. Is anybody writing what this one is? There's loads of people saying ballad, and um, some people yeah. adding that it's a, a male, and uh, someone even saying drake. Exactly. So this, this is our classic kind of male mallard duck. And because it's so common, actually, it's often, it's often ignored by a lot of people. But it's really worth knowing, actually, that, that first of all, we're not getting as many mallards coming to Britain for the winter. And we're not quite sure that this is because they are genuinely declining or whether it's simply because we're having much milder winters, both in Britain and Western Europe. And it means that less mallard ducks have to actually fly across the North Sea and the English Channel to come and winter here. And they're a beautiful duck. This is the male, you're quite right. Big yellow beak, green head. This beautiful uh, patch on the wing called the speculum, which is a, a shiny iridescent wing patch. Um, the females have it as well and it's often used in communication when they're flying around and keeping in touch with each other when they're flying. But if you'd been um, around Warwickshire back in July, August time, you may not have spotted these male ducks because they looked like females. And all ducks during July and August time, they molt and they lose all of their wing feathers and they become flightless and grow new feathers. And if they were in this kind of gaudy bright plumage, they'd be very vulnerable to predators. So instead they grow a plumage that looks like the female and you can still tell the males because they still have a yellow beak. Um, but often people think the males have all disappeared and they are there. You just need to look for that that beak. Now, someone mentioned this as one of their favourite birds. So again, in the chat, can you um, just have a go? What one's this one? Okay, so we've got uh, quite a few people saying moorhen. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the moorhen, sometimes confused with the coot, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, the coot is a much sort of roundier black bird with a white beak. The moorhen classically has the red beak with the yellow tip white little bottom and those little white bits on the lip, on the side of the body there. What about this one? This is an exotic duck um, that we we do have on, on different sort of patches of water around the UK. Um, it's not from Britain originally. Anybody know what this one's one of my favourite ducks actually? There's a few people saying Mandarin duck. Um, and duck. Yeah, man. Um, added exactly. that it's a drake. Exactly. So this is a male mandarin duck. The female has grey plumage with lots of white spots. The male ducks being much more colourful than the females. And they're very colourful at this time of the year because they're displaying to each other. So if you are out and about um, for your sort of daily walks or driving somewhere to go for one of your uh, daily kind of exercises, um, you know, watch what ducks are doing, including mallard ducks. Male mallards at this time of the year will be rising up out of the water or whistling to each other to show off and display and court um, a female and hopefully this one's reasonably easy for most of you what one's this one grey heron seems to be the consensus, heron, to be the consensus. exactly so this is our grey heron and what I want to get across really is that I, I can't see the chat at the moment but hopefully lots of you have been contributing there is that actually without realising it, probably many of you do actually know the sights and the sounds of, of quite a few different sorts of birds. I'm sure if I play, some of you mentioned about not, not, not being so good at bird sounds, but I'm sure 
if I play you some of these sounds, let me just play you. I've got this special device here that plays bird sounds. I hope you can hear it. So what's this one, for example? That should be relatively easy, although not all of you may have heard one before. Got a couple of people saying cuckoo. Exactly. So that's our, our cuckoo there. Um, what else? Some of you have this as your favourite bird. Let's see if anybody knows what this one is. Anybody know what that is, Debbie? Yeah, so what are people saying, Robin? Exactly. So we've got our Robin there and this one. That should be quite easy. So we got a couple of tawny owls for that one. Exactly, that's our tawny owl. And tawny owls can be heard quite a lot at the moment as we go into the winter time. They are displaying, they are seeing off, they're being territorial. And tawny owls will start nesting as early as January or February time. So if you've got your window open at night, particularly on these mild evenings at the moment, you might well hear a tawny owl calling, even, even in very urban or suburban areas. So hopefully some of those sounds, some of these, these, these visuals for you are familiar and actually for most of us it's just a, it's about building up on on top of what i've shown you this evening here's another bird this one might be a bit more tricky for some of you i know some of you were saying you find wade is a bit tricky but what about this bird here black and white long orange beak bright pink legs often nests on gravel pits around um, warwickshire so emma says oyster capture Yes, you're correct there, Emma. So this is an oyster catcher. And some of you have put about wading birds being quite tough to identify, and some of them can be, but the oyster catcher is a classic kind of noisy piping bird, um, which actually, even from a distance, even if you haven't got binoculars, is often very striking, very easy to notice with that long orange beak, those pink legs and the black and white body. All right, so we've introduced, I've introduced a, a number of birds there. So how do we identify birds? So what I'd like you to do now is going back to the Padlet, I'll just come out of my thing here so I can see it, is when you are going out and about walking and, list and, and what have you, what sort of things might we want to be noticing about those birds that can help us identify it? What sort of things, you know, if we're looking across a pond with birds, just, just thinking about what we've just looked at. What sort of, um, what sort of different things are we wanting to be aware of to perhaps be able to identify what those birds are? I'll see if I can keep track of. Uh... Brilliant! How they are sitting. Yep. Yeah, size, colour, tail shape. That's a really good one. Tail shape's really good, particularly for things like ravens, for example, and crows. Habitats, yes, habitats really important actually as well. And I'm thinking about where you actually are. Flight pattern, flight patterns are really good one. Woodpeckers, for example, have this amazing kind of undulating up and down flight pattern that's very, very, very distinctive. Male and female, exactly. So I've shown you quite a few sort of male ducks, but later on I'm going to show you a few female ducks as well. And there's a really good BTOID video that talks about female ducks. And actually when you start to look at them closely, there are some quite nice sort of subtle differences between them to be able to identify them. Beak length, exactly. Time of the year is really important. Interesting enough, some people have been seeing swallows over the last few days, believe it or not. There's still the odd swallow around with this warm weather we've been having. They presumably still been finding insects, but generally time of the year, exactly when swallows, for example, uh, are actually mostly out of this country now. And we're looking at winter birds as we go. So brilliant. I'll just have a look, check through here, volume of noise, colour, flight pattern, how they're sitting. Um, feather colour is really important, their size, and size can be quite difficult to judge sometimes, but it is important. Um, let me just see if I can move that thing there a little bit, there we go. Wingspan and shape, absolutely, and the shape of the bird wings is all very important. Excellent, so thank you very much for your contributions there. 
let me just go back to presentation there we go absolutely so all those different things you mentioned. so for example in these picture here we've got some little egrets so if they're just flying by themselves they're actually quite difficult to judge size and size can be difficult but you're looking here at the fact that they are pure white they've got a black beak there is another bird called the great egret um, which is a gray heron size it's much much bigger than these little egrets which has a yellow beak at this time of the year you're looking at the fact they've got their legs trailing behind them. So it's, it's picking up on all these different sorts of clues. And the other thing also to remember is that um, what you see in a bird book is often the perfect kind of photograph or illustration. But what you see in real life is often changed by the light and where the birds are. So often I say to people, go with your gut reaction of what you think something is and follow it up afterwards with the book or online. Um, but don't be too perturbed if what you see in the book isn't necessarily identical because actually a book is showing you in the perfect light and the perfect plumage. And of course, your real life birds aren't always like that. Now, I don't, you don't need to have to know all these kind of bird parts, but it is worth just being aware of when you are watching a bird, there are some quite key parts of a bird to be aware of. So, for example, if you look in the middle of the wing, there are some feathers called the greater coverts. And those greater coverts are quite useful because often the tips of them are coloured. They might be custard coloured, like, for example, in a, in a dunnock or a house bow. They might be tipped white, for example, in a chaffinch or grey in a bullfinch. So those greater coverts can be quite useful sometimes at identifying a bird. The rump. So if you look towards the tail and the base of the tail, you've got the upper tail coverts and the rump. So that rump can be quite useful. For example, in a bullfinch, as a bullfinch flies away from you when you're walking along maybe a country path, for example, you might see this flash of white where the white of the rump of the bird is, 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 is becoming very visible. Also, the head of the bird's quite useful. The nape, the back of the head, the crown, and also sometimes whether they have a stripe going through their, their head as well can be very useful. So as I say, you don't necessarily need to know all of these different parts, but there are certain parts of the wing and the head that can be very useful. All right. So going on then, what I want us to think about really is thinking about um, two surveys, which I'll come back to a little bit later. But, but basically, by knowing some of these things about these birds that live on the water and in the woodlands, we can actually then take in surveys where we can actively go out and not just go out for our, our our sort of daily exercise but actually in the springtime or the wetland bird surveys done every kind of second or third sunday in the month you can actively go out and record birds and, and actually then upload those onto different survey websites um, and that will actually then contribute towards our science and understanding of those birds so i'll come back to those a little bit later on but i want to what i want to do first of all is think a bit about woodland birds and then what I'm going to do is have a little break, maybe for five minutes or something. Um, and then we're going to come back uh, and look a little bit more at sort of water and, and wetland birds. So here I've got um, 11 different birds. And what I think would be quite nice, is, for those of you who'd like to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's anonymous on the Padlet, which is really nice. But spend maybe a few minutes just maybe not jotting down what some of these things are maybe just put the number and what you think it is on the padlet um can we do that at the same time can they are we able to look at the screen and do the padlet at the same time if not we can jot it down maybe jot it down or just just mentally or it might was it easier to put it onto the um the the, the um the uh, notes? Yeah, it's probably easy to put it on the chat because you can see it at the oh. same time, yeah, or at okay. least I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, that, that, that's true. So maybe put it onto the chat. And if there's some you know, just put the number and what you think the bird is. And this isn't to test you, it's, it, but it is a chance just to sort of get a little bit interactive what these birds are. I'm going to go through what they are, so don't worry. But, it's, but again, it's just, just helping you to realise perhaps that some of these you do already know. So we'll just give you um, a minute or two to do that. Some of these might be completely alien to you, so don't worry. <laughs> the idea of tonight really is to sort of reinforce stuff you do already know, but also hopefully add some new things to, to um, what you already know as well. <clears throat> do you know all of those, Debbie? <laughs> uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Got some of my faves there. Oh, excellent. When oh, you look at them like this, 
Oh, brilliant. When you look at them like this, you actually realise that we do have some very colourful birds in this country. And even for me, some of the brown birds are really, really pretty when you see them up close. I can see people looking at them closely, so we'll, we'll give another minute or two. <laughs> yeah, there's still lots of answers coming. I think my particular faves are number four and eight. eight. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I'm just trying to see if I can see the chat. Oh, hold a minute. I think I can. There we go. I managed to bring it up now. Ah, I can see it. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, great. Okay. <clears throat> I just needed to press the button. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see how many of you got those photographs and the sounds, actually. So that's really thanks for all your contributions there. Excellent. Daisy's had a really good good plug there at getting those. Well, I'm glad someone's had a go at six. <laughs> six is a six six is a tricky one. And uh, I will actually show you a few slides of those. <clears throat> Yeah, one's a bit tricky, isn't it? We don't often see, number one is one of our most common kind of woodland and garden birds, but we actually don't see it very often. So it's not always a familiar one, but Emma's got it there. <laughs> I think with one, you often see its movement more than anything else. For number one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely, definitely. Yeah, six definitely a tricky one, and uh, I can see why people are saying cult it. It's not cult it, but uh, I can see why people are saying it's a cult it. We'll come back to it in a minute. Brilliant. I think that's most people contributing there. So thank you very much for your contributions. And actually, I'm really impressed. Um, number six, yeah, could, it looks a bit like a black cap. It isn't a black cap, but it looks a bit like a black cap. Um, but most of you getting some really nice ones crept there. So we'll go through those. So number one, um, well, actually, I can do this quite cleverly if I go back to my slideshow. There we go. So all is revealed. <laughs> so you can see number one, there was Wren. Number two, Robin. Song Thrush number three. I think some of you got Song Thrush. Let's have a quick look. Don't think many people did, actually. Yeah, a few of you did, Manda did. Um, so a few of you got Song Thrush there. Number four, a number of you got there, the tree creeper, like a little mouse climbing up the tree. Uh, number four, the blue tit, um, the red wing down here in the middle, which is a winter visitor, a thrush that comes here from Norway and Sweden. Got these eye stripes across the head there. We've got our nut hatch, number eight. And this one here, which is the tricky one. So it is a marsh tit um, where you all are in Warwickshire you're very lucky because you do also get the willow tit and I'll show you the two in a moment and um, there is the cold tit but the cold tit is smaller and has a white patch right at the very back of the head it looks a bit more like a sort of miniature kind of great tit kind of washed out great tit and then we've got our blackbird and our bullfin so well done everybody there for having a good go and this is a, a photograph of um, a willow tit um, a bit grainy, but it just shows you this is a very cryptic bird. They love sort of wet habitats. They actually make their nests in damp, rotting wood. So they, um, they're not as common as they used to be across Britain. They're one of our fastest declining woodland birds. But some of their strongholds are still in the Midlands and up north into Yorkshire. They particularly like some of the old um, coal fields and industrial sites in, in, in Sheffield. In Yorkshire uh, where the sites have become derelict and you've had all this fabulous kind of young scrubby habitat develop um, but they also do need rotting dead wood to be able to, to make their nests into and here's a marsh tit um, which is more common it's still declining but it's a more common bird they particularly like woodlands where you've got lots of dense kind of understory habitat particularly with things like hazel trees all kind of not hazel trees that are just kind of dotted everywhere but but joining together with each other and uh, a lot of over browsing of woodlands by deer we've got too many deer in this country um can often remove that kind of important habitat for marsh tits so here they are together oh apologies that the words just gone over the head there and but they the key thing is they look almost identical but they sound completely different and 
they are they really are a bird to listen out for when you are in sort of quite wet woodlands and perhaps more older ancient woodlands throughout Warwickshire. And I'll play the differences. So the marsh tit's a bird that I grew up with actually. Um, and it sort of sounds like it's sneezing. It kind of goes pachoo. So this is the marsh tit. And you can often hear that in woodlands. And then this is the willow tit. So you can hear it's quite a different sort of call there. So the birds have evolved this very similar cryptic plumage for living in our woodlands, but they do actually have their own different niches and then very different calls. And it's those calls that can help give away what they actually are. And you can see here the willow tits distribution. These are from the BTO's um, map, um, special map pages, which I can show you later. And all these downward triangles, we've lost over 75% of them in the last 25, 30 years or so. But their strongholds are still in parts of sort of middle Wales, Midlands, and then up into Yorkshire. And the marsh tit, again, not declined as much, but still a declining species. And this is all because we have lots of neglected woodlands. We have woodlands that are over browsed by deer. Um, and just, and also in some cases, woodland that's becoming, when I say undermanaged, really becoming too, too closed canopy. And so it's, it's not allowing that kind of understory and her, herby kind of layer to kind of develop and grow up. But nonetheless, worth being aware of those two birds. All right. So here we've got our, um, we've already looked at these a little bit. We've got our blackbirds and our song thrushes. So blackbirds, hopefully you'll see, even if you're in suburban and urban parts of Warwickshire, the male blackbird, as I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite birds with its black body, yellow beak. If you see any that look like an adult male blackbird at this time of the year, but they've got a dark beak, they are actually young birds from earlier this year. So they've molted into their male plumage, winter plumage, but they've still yet to develop the yellow beak. Often their wings are slightly brownier than, um, than, than the rest of their plumage. The female blackbird is brown, keeping a nice and camouflage. She does have some spotting, but not those big dark spots like a song thrush has. Um, the song thrush always has these dark spots against the white background. And then a young blackbird, which you won't really see at this time of the year, has much more sort of gingery, orangey kind of spotting and kind of flecking across its breast. And the blackbird for me has this beautiful kind of fluty song, very measured. And uh, let's see if I can just play it for you here. We won't really start hearing the blackbird until sort of February, March time. It's lovely and fluty. And it has these little pauses between its phrases while it's listening for other blackbirds. And so blackbirds, particularly as we get into sort of March time, will often be on prominent places like TV aerials, tops of trees, singing away. And the great thing about a blackbird, actually, is they're often very obvious when they're singing, particularly in suburban areas. So they're a good bird to start with. And I learned a lot of my bird song when I was a teenager, and it was really a process of finding the bird and listening, or sorry, hearing it first and then finding the bird, hearing the bird, finding it, and over time making that association with what the bird was actually singing and doing and who it was. Then down here we've got our song thrush. Now song thrushes aren't as common uh, as blackbirds, but we will still see them in suburban areas, in parks, often on the edges of kind of parks where you've got a bit of woodland maybe. Um, they love feeding on snails, so they often hammer a snail against a rock called an anvil and leave a kind of pool of snail shells around. And again, they, they might well start singing at this time of the year, <clears throat> particularly as we get towards Christmas time. And they have a very repetitive song, a very loud repetitive song. This is the song thrush. So hopefully you can hear that the song thrush is sort of going So they often repeat the same kind of note very loudly two, three, four, five times before changing. And again, like the blackbird, they do often perch somewhere quite high, often at the top of a tree. So when you're walking through a park or a woodland, 
you can hear this very repetitive loud bird you want to be looking towards the top of the tree they can be quite well hidden even when there's no leaves on the tree but you're looking towards the top of the tree for the song thrush so here's our lovely blackbird and at this time of the year we have lots of blackbirds arriving uh, for the winter coming here from norway and finland denmark and Sweden and you don't notice them necessarily because they look pretty much the same um, but as we get into February March time and more blackbirds come into gardens you might well notice maybe around Christmas time um, there's so much food in the countryside at the moment it's been such a great bonanza year for berries and nuts that a lot of blackbirds are currently feeding on hawthorn berries and fruit berries in the countryside so if you see a lovely big hawthorn tree with the haw red haw berries that's the place at the moment to be looking for blackbirds and holly trees too and this is just showing you for the West Midlands how blackbirds are doing. Um, just to explain, we'll see a few of these graphs. We've got the year along the bottom. Along the left hand side, we've got a, a sort of standardized index where back in 1994, everything started at 100. So we can see that from that standardized point in 1994, blackbirds have actually increased over the last 20 years or so. And although they're showing a tiny bit of a decrease, that may well just iron out and go back up again. Um, it may just be sort of a bit of a natural fluctuation. So blackbirds are actually doing, we've actually got more blackbirds in the West Midlands now than we had 20, 25 years ago, which is good to hear. Now, another bird that some of you may be aware of is the missile thrush. And if any of you do sport um, and are out on playing fields at this time of the year, the missile thrush is, is one to look out for. Because whereas the song thrush is quite shy and likes to be in the woodland or on the edge of a playing field where there might be a hedgerow, the bold missile thrush likes to be out in the open, very upright, very much more bolder spotting and greyer plumage. And when it flies, and many of you remember put flights in one of those things to look out for, they have more of an undulating flight, more of an up or down flight. And if you look really closely, they even have a bit of white in their outer tail feathers, which song thrushes don't have. But one of the key sounds to listen for with a missile thrush is a rattle. And uh, they have this rattly call. And none of the other thrushes made that sound really. So that's a really good sound to be listening for uh, and looking for. Um, song thrushes aren't doing so well uh, as they have been. Uh, their numbers have been going up and up and up in the West Midlands. Their numbers going down a bit. But generally, I think across England, song thrushes are doing much better than they were in the 90s. During the 90s, we had quite a lot of hot summers that I think removed their food of slugs and snails. Um, there was a lot of problems I think in, in agricultural areas for them they have generally been doing quite well so we'll have to keep monitoring and see how that goes but you know what it's, it's, it's by people like yourselves going out and doing for example breeding bird surveys that gives us this kind of very accurate information of how birds are doing in different parts of the UK so on our um, left hand side here we've got the song thrush the right hand side we've got the missile thrush you may be going oh my god they look all look the same but actually if you look at the missile thrush on the right hand side, the spots tend to be much rounder and bolder. It has more orange colored legs. And as I say, it's often the where. So some of you put habitat as an important thing about identifying birds. It's the fact that you see the missile thrushes in large open areas, cricket fields, playing fields, school fields, parkland areas. Um, if you're in a forest, you might well get them as well at the tops of trees or rattling as they're flying over. Whereas the song thrush, you tend to get much more in the woodland and on the woodland edges. And here's a, a juvenile, a young missile thrush, just showing you that contrast between its kind of very greyish young plumage. And then it's just starting to get through that nice kind of custard yellow spotting with those much darker spots on the breast there. And here's another missile thrush. And a bird to listen out for and look out for at the moment is the red wing. And the red wing, as you can hopefully see on the map here, we have some coming from Iceland, if you live in the north of England, and in the Midlands, we tend to get them coming from Scandinavia. And if you go outside tonight, you might well hear a red wing because they migrate at night and you can often hear them making a little contact call. This one here. Can you hear that okay? Yeah. So they make this little kind of call and if you go outside you might well hear it tonight because there might well be red wings migrating you need to be just be listening for them sometimes you might hear them on a night when you've got much more lower a lower cloud base and you can hear them migrating over and uh, they spend the winter the key thing about a red wing if you see one in a bush is that unlike a missile thrush or a song thrush 
it's got this white stripe across the eye there and it doesn't have these big bold spots it's much more of a smudge as if someone's got a uh, a watercolor brush and just smudged the spots um all the way over its breast like that and in march time you'll see these in flocks on the ground often quite tame in parks and playing fields um, because they're fattening up on earthworms prior to migrating back. So in March time, look out for these on the ground. They can often be very, very tame. Uh, and, just to say, uh, in Warwickshire, we often get um, quite large amounts of Coombe Country Park at that time of year. Ah, which country park? Coombe Country Park. Coombe Country Park, brilliant, yeah. So it's a good, good time of the year to, look to be for looking those. for them. Another bird that's been arriving over the last month and is still arriving also from Scandinavia, and if any of you go to Poland or, or um, Switzerland, even during the summertime, you'll see these breeding in those countries. This is the field fair, and it's a very colourful flush with a greyish blue head, brownish back, uh, again, often flying around in flocks. That's another bird to be looking out for on berries and fruits and things like that. So here are all four of those thrushes in summary. The song thrush, much shyer in the woodlands, the missile thrush, bolder in open areas, the red wing, feeding lots on berries at the moment and the field fair will also join them as we get more into the winter time. All right, another, uh, some of these are repeats, but the whole idea of tonight is a bit of reinforcement. So I've got some classic kind of woodland or woodland edge birds here. Um, I haven't got these one numbered actually, which is a bit, um, <laughs> I numbered the earlier ones and not these ones, but um, have another go on the chat. And uh, you could always just say top left, top right, top middle. I think they're, they're pretty much almost in a, in a nice kind of way in which you can describe them. But uh, again, I'll stop talking for a moment or two and just give you a chance to reflect and have a go at writing um, down what you think some of these woodland birds are. Just while people are having a go, um, if the person that is uh, listed as iPhone could just message me in the chat or something to let me know your name so that I can tick you off on the register. <clears throat> Brilliant. So some of them are coming in. Excellent. So some really good answers here. Uh, one of them's, <laughs> it's always good to have one there that slightly challenges people a little bit more. Most of you are getting these pretty much all right, actually. Brilliant. All right. So um, really good attempt there by people. Yep. Lots of you going for the woodpecker in the bottom left. Yep. Middle right. You're right there. It is long tail tit. <laughs> All right, let's give uh, another 10 seconds or so. Brilliant. So some really good answers there. Um, you're absolutely right. The top left hand bird, I started with this one right at the start. So it's all about putting little clues in throughout today's presentation and helping to reinforce. It is the gold crest. The top there is the blue tits one of the most common birds we might get coming to visit to bird feeders and certainly at the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust Nature Reserves, many of those do have bird feeders where you can watch them. Brandon Marsh in usual times has got a lovely cafe where you can sit and watch the, the birds come into the feeders and hopefully when things change after COVID-19 you can visit places like there and, and, and see the birds come into the feeder. You're quite right, the top right hand one is indeed the nuthatch, um, often going down the tree and I was watching one the other day, it was brilliant, it had a nut but it wedged into a, a hole in a crevice in an oak tree and was hammering away at it with its very stout beak. 
Um, we've got our long tail tit on the right, which you all got. Um, we've got bottom right great tit with the black and white head. The bottom left is indeed a woodpecker. It's a great spotted woodpecker, as most of you got there. And the middle one, some of you putting a question mark, but you're right, it is indeed a bird called a dunnock. And uh, this is a type of bird called an ancentor. If any of you ever go skiing in the Alps, you might see their alpine ancentor, which is their relative, often tame around ski resorts. But this bird here is the dunnock. It's quite a, um, uh, can be quite sort of a discreet bird, often around the base of bird tables. It's often in scrubby habitat on the edge of woodlands. Has a very interesting sex life because you have all sorts of, all sorts of interesting kind of combinations of several males or several females, several females with one male. Um, you get an alpha male and a beta male and they, they sort of both peck at the female's bottom to sort of get her to eject the sperm so they can then mate with her. So all sorts of interesting kind of things going on with the uh, with the dunnock. So it may look and seem very shy but it has a really interesting life and actually when you see it in the hand and I do bring these sometimes they are very colourful, very pretty birds actually. So really really good there. There's the names of them hopefully should come up. Oh. There we go. So you can see the, their names there. Um, so a good attempt there by everybody. So let's look at these, some of these birds in a little bit more detail. Um, here's our blue tip, classic bird of the bird feeder, doing pretty well in the Midlands. Their numbers since 94 have actually just, just gently gone up and down over time. This year they apparently didn't do so well, even though we had that gorgeous weather and you might think, oh, this weather's brilliant for birds because it went on for so long. Lots of flowering plants um, withered, Lots of insects didn't therefore develop or have their food plants. And so actually towards the end of May, when blue tits should have had plenty of food, they didn't have as many as much food as what we think they would have done. So we don't think they had as good a year, perhaps as they might have done if that sunshine and that heat had lasted a little bit less long. But we'll see once the breeding bird survey results come out. But a lovely bird to see at the bird feeder. Lots of great antics. In contrast, you've got the great tip, which is probably about 20% bigger, much bigger bird with a black and white head, much more white on the outer tail feathers there. And uh, again, another fabulous bird to see. And, ha and has a different niche to the blue tip. It has a much bigger stouter beak. It's much more likely to be spotted feeding on the woodland floor, um, searching for invertebrates and nuts uh, in the leaf litter and also hammering away at nuts and seeds in trees themselves. Whereas the blue tit is going to be much more on the outskirts of the, the trees and the leaves. They're a much lighter bird. And the great tits have a hierarchy as well. So in your, if you have a garden or when you visit a bird feeding station, it's the more dominant, um, healthier birds that tend to be feeding first and the younger birds and the females tend to um, be subordinate. They have to come in actually sort of second to those, those, those more uh, dominant birds. So there's an interesting kind of hierarchy that goes on. And their classic call that you'll hear in February time, January, February time is kind of this, this teacher, teacher call. They have all sorts of little ring, ring and bell like sounds. And chirs. And let me just play their song. This is one of their songs. They have quite a few different songs. And the classic one is this teacher, teacher, teacher. And just as we're coming out of winter time in late February, early March, it's a really beautiful sound to hear because you know spring is on its way as the male great tits are responding to those lengthening days. The, it's causing their hormones, the testosterone to grow, uh, to, to move through their body, their testes start to grow and they're stimulated to start singing. So it's a really nice bird to be listening for. You may even hear a little bit of song um, at this time of the year going towards Christmas. And you can see the two side by side here quite happily. You can see the great tip there is that little bit bigger and more longer tailed. All right, um, some finches. So over to you again, we've got uh, the male and females here. Um, so what finches have we um, got here in front of us? These are some other birds that you will see in woodland and also on woodland edge um, throughout Warwickshire.
<clears throat> I must just say that the top left hand bird, the illustration shows it much more red than you would naturally see it actually. It's usually a bit more sort of, uh, a bit more sort of less bright red than that one. But some, most of you are getting it. Again, one or two of these you've already seen, or one of them you've already seen anyway, <laughs> the male of. And hopefully for many of you, this is just, just a really nice reinforcement. And actually there's quite a few birds you do know. And hopefully for those of you who are new to this, hopefully it's just helping to, to just present and introduce you to some of these new birds. Many of these also will come to bird feeders as well, which is always a nice, nice way of seeing them. All right, so let's reveal then what some of these are. Oh. There we go. So we've got our chaffinch at the top there. We've got our male on the left, not as bright as that normally. Female on the right, much more grey plumage. But remember I showed you the bird and the labels on the birds. They've got these white edges to their, their greater coverts. Just here where my mouse is, just going around there. They've got these white edges to their greater coverts. And up here on the shoulder here, they've got these scapula feathers. Under, they've got some coverts on the wing uh, called epaulets, which are also white and interesting enough in the male the more symmetrical and the bigger those those white patches the sexier is the more attractive he is to the female birds here with our bullfinch we have the white rump that i mentioned to you earlier the female is a beautiful kind of peachy gray color when you see her she's not gray she's more of a peachy gray color the male with this bright red breast very shy birds but as i mentioned often when you're walking along they fly out of some brambles they like feeding on bramble um, blackberry seeds um you'll often notice the white rump at the bottom here we've got our green finch and on the right here, we've got our goldfinch. And the goldfinch is a very pretty bird, feeds on a whole variety of different flowering plants. It's doing very well. And it's got this bright yellow on the wing. So before we have a break in a few minutes, I'm just gonna um, go through, through the finches quickly. So here's our goldfinch. They classically love coming to Niger seed in a feeder, but I have them feeding on sunflower hearts, but they feed on a whole variety of different wild seeds as well including things like knapweeds weeds and teasel and they even come to things like evening primrose seeds that people might have growing in their gardens and since the 90s their numbers have just been going up and up and up they don't seem to have suffered in the same way other birds have uh, other finches have with agri changing agricultural practices they're very good at feeding on lots of different composite flowering plants like dandelions for example and groundsel and wild lettuce and stuff like that so they are able to find lots of these different flowering plants across the countryside still and also many of us put food out for them specifically for attracting goldfinches so they seem to be doing very well and then we've got our chaffinch this is the male here in the winter time house sparrows yellow hammers chaffinches rebuntings they actually in the autumn time grow new head feathers that have got very dark edges to keep them more cryptic and camouflaged in the winter and then through abrasion the tips wear away to reveal a beautiful bright plumaged male in the springtime so it's a great way of actually saving energy you don't have to grow new head feathers in April time you just allow natural wear and tear to break off the tips so I'll show you a picture in a moment but their numbers have been going down this is what we think we think this is probably related to disease I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. But here's a male chaffinch up close. You can just see the blue tips of its head starting to come through. There's a bit of wear and tear happening on the top of that head there. Here's the female, uh, very similarly shaped, very similar wing markings, but just much grayer. And here's the two of them together here. And in the springtime and April time, that male will have this really bright bluey gray head. And the green finch, beautiful, beautiful bird, much thicker beak than a chaffinch um, or a, a goldfinch. Very good at cracking open seeds of things like hawthorn and blackberry, for example. The female, this is the male, very green and yellow. Female, a little bit sort of grey or brown. But sadly, the green finches and chaffinches have been suffering a disease. You may, if you have bird feeders um, at home, have seen sometimes the odd, uh, very unwell bird at the base of the bird feeder. And it's an indication that you need to give your bird feeders a really good clean. And there's a, 
a tiny parasite, um, trichomoniasis, that infects their breathing and their kind of food digestive system and causes them to die. And it's it, it's kind of jumped from pigeons and doves into the finches and it's had a devastating effect on greenfinch population and seems to be having a sort of delayed but devastating effect on the chaffinch population as well. The ones we're left with, certainly with the green finches, hopefully are resistant birds. They have resistance to this, this particular parasite. And um, certainly where I am, I've had, I have them breeding now in the garden or near the garden. So hopefully their numbers will, will over time start to recover. But definitely some good birds to be looking out for. But you can see here how the green fish numbers have just gone down and down and down because of this, this disease. So um, the message really is to feed your garden birds but if you do see birds looking unwell to to clean your feeders take them away for a bit so that birds can disperse um, but also regularly clean your bird feeders anyway take all the food out particularly when it's been raining give them a really good clean with some mild detergent and let them dry properly um, before you put them back out again all right so there's our green finch feeding on the feeder there and just a couple of birds before we finish our break the dunnock the goldcrest the wren and the wren, as Debbie was mentioning, you often see or notice the movement of wren, maybe in the brambles, the undergrowth. It's got a little sticky up tail. Very, very loud song for the size of the bird. This is its song. And, um, but can be quite difficult to see, but a good bird to be looking out for. And here's a close up of a wren. Um, they are basically like little mice, little avian mice, just moving their way through the brambles. Here's our Dunnock, beautiful bird, bluey grey head there with these markings, little reddish orange legs. Um, you don't tend to notice them so much in woodland and parklands. It's a bird you notice much more in your garden, but they do love kind of stacks of bramble and scrub and uh, good bird to look out for. And you might sometimes see the males, the alpha males, wing flicking. They're flicking their wings up and showing off to each other. And then the gold crest, which is a bird which I really, really encourage you to listen for at this time of the year because you'll suddenly hear them everywhere. You'll often hear them making these little squeaky sounds. And if you hear them singing, but if you're anywhere where there's evergreen trees, holly, fir trees, etc., Christmas tree type trees, listen and look for these gold crests. They can sometimes be quite tame, but equally they can sometimes be right at the tops of these fir trees, but it's listening for those squeaky sounds. And towards then I'll show you a website you can go where you can look up some of these, these different sounds of birds. All right, so what I think we'll do is we'll stop for five minutes, if that's okay, Deb, and we'll come back at 20 past seven. So just give you a little bit of a breather. Um, if it, obviously it gives you a chance maybe just to reflect a little bit on what we've been doing. I'm going to move on to sort of wading birds and ducks a little bit after the break um, and obviously if you've got any questions I need to just make sure we've got a little bit of time towards the end for, for any questions but um, they are obviously things you can obviously post now and Debbie can sort of make a note of so I'll, I'll let you just have a break and a breather and we'll come back in about five minutes or so.
<clears throat> All right, we'll just wait for everybody to um, come back in and let me just share my screen again. All right, so it's 20 past, so I'll, I'll get started again. Um, hope you can see here, I just wanted to, I, the British House Fund Lithology have some fantastic resources, both for you getting involved in birds, but also for actually learning more about them. And I know one of you mentioned about finding, identifying crows quite difficult, for example. And there is actually, I won't have time tonight to play them, but they're there for you to look at. If you simply, um, on a search engine, just put in BTO ID videos, it'll come up with a page where you can actually see all the different ones. There'll be like a sort of, if I go to identification videos here, um, there's like a little search engine which, which lists lots of different birds which you can then actually search and look for. So it's a really good one. One of you also put doves and pigeons. There's a really nice one here to do with looking at the different sounds of collared dove and wood pigeon. And there is another one also to do with identifying different pigeons and doves. So bird identification videos is a really nice extension beyond today. It's a really nice follow up exercise after today because it helps give you other birds that I can't possibly squeeze into tonight. You also hear a different voice and it's presented usually in sort of two to three minutes or so. There's also a really nice one on identifying female ducks. It's about seven minutes long. That one's slightly longer, but it's a really good, really good one to look at. So I'm going to come back to some more of these resources uh, in a short while. Um, but what I want to do in the second half is to think a bit about water birds, because there's a lot of water, as I mentioned, around Warwickshire. And so it's worth just focusing on some of those. We'll go on to waders as well. And then I want to finish off with some of the resources and ways in which you guys can actually get involved. Now, I mentioned in my video right at the start that you can do wetland bird surveys. And in essence, really, all across Warwickshire, there are certain water bodies. Some of them are already being surveyed, but some are vacant and waiting for surveyors. And you can go to small water bodies, big water bodies. I tend to do a smallish, well, a medium sized pond, really. It doesn't have huge amounts on it, but actually the BTO want to hear about those lakes that have loads on and also those that don't have much on at all. And in essence, really, you're looking for strategic places where you can try and see the whole lake or in my case, my one, I can walk all the way around so I can see if there's any ducks or wading birds hiding under the bushes, for example. And every second or third Sunday in the month, you can basically record all the different water birds you see and then you upload them onto a particular website. So it's a nice thing to do. Um, so here we've got three different types of ducks, the male and females, top, middle, bottom. So if you can have a little go at identifying what these three different species are, they, the males on the left, male, the females on the right, but what are these three reasonably kind of common ducks really that we get around the, the Midlands? The top one should be easy because that's one we've already had earlier today. Let's just see what people come up with. Yeah, exactly. So the top one there is our classic mallard. What about the middle and the bottom ones? Excellent. Emma's got them all, all crap there. Brilliant. So absolutely, we've got our mallard on top. We've got the gadwall duck in the middle, which is an increasing duck that we see around our wetlands. And on the bottom here, we've got our shoveler duck. Excellent. Joshua got all three of those as well. So here we go. Here's the three, three of them there. And two types of diving ducks. What are these two species here? These are two diving ducks, very common around... Um, the sort of flooded gravel pits that we have around uh, the Midlands. The bottom one, the potchard, not as common as it used to be. I've just mentioned its name. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So we've got our brilliant, yeah, so we've got our tufted duck on top there, and we've got our potchard below. And again, we've got the tufted duck here. I was mentioning these in my video at the start. Bright yellow eye, these white panels. The females are much more of a chocolatey brown. The males below with a reddish head. Females on the right there, much greyer, the potchard there. All right, so these are just some ducks that you could be looking out for. Uh, one of you have this as your favourite duck. This is the teal duck, which uh, is kind of the size of um, your, you know, can sit in your hand very happily. Uh, the male with this beautiful kind of colourful head, 
a female, very brown, but has a green speculum. So I told you about that blue patch on the mallard duck earlier, but the female and the male too have a green patch instead. And the female too will tend to look much darker and smaller, almost very hard to miss, very easy to miss actually on a wetland. They can be very cryptic. Even the males with those heads, those heads actually look very dull uh, in, in poor light and, and almost you, you won't see the detail of that yellow at all. So a few ID tips. Well, if you're looking for female ducks like this, you're often looking for the colour of their wings and the shapes of their beaks. So this is a shoveler duck on the left with that big, broad beak, for example. And if you look, you might just be able to see there's a little bit of green on her wing, whereas the female mallard on the right has the classic bluey purple speculum and quite a mottly kind of beak. So there's our mallards. And even when they're up ending, you can still see that bright blue. They're the only duck in Britain that have that blue in the wing. And then this is our gadwall. So gadwall is an increasing duck that we see more and more on wetlands across the Midlands. And uh, this is the male, very beautiful when you see it up close, very gray and black from the distance, but lots of these patterns and vermiculations that make it a very pretty duck. Male has this black beak, lots of pretty colors on it. And importantly, the male and females have white on the wing. So when you see them flying away, you'll often notice this kind of white patch on the wing here. And then our teal, Teal are often hidden on the edges of little islands around gravel pits and often on the edges of reed beds, often huddled together with snipe and things like that. And the males have this kind of white streak going right across the top of their wing. And here's a range of different photographs. But in all of those, pretty much, apart from the male, you can see the green speculum and they're much darker and smaller than the, the mallard duck. And you can see the green speculum there on this female, which I was ringing um, at Slimbridge. All right, let's move on to wading birds now. So here are three common waders, um, all of which you might get passing through the West Midlands. A lot of them you'll get on estuaries. What do you think these three common wading birds are? Just based on their beak. We've got one that's going up, one that's going down, and one we've already come across a little bit earlier on in this evening. Excellent. Yep. So Joshua's got the bottom one right. Yep. Somebody's got all three there. Top right. Becca. Yes, you're right. You are correct. Brilliant. So most people getting those right one there. You're quite right. Yes. Yep. So the top left hand one is in fact an avocet. The top right is a curlew and the bottom one is an oyster catcher. So wading birds, as many of you mentioned right at the very start on the um, on the screen when we were writing everything out, are can be very tricky. And but I think rather than worrying about those small grey ones that are very similar, the dunlin, the knot, etc. Start with the ones that are striking. The curly is our largest wading bird, that long down curved beak. You tend to see it much more on sort of estuaries and rivers, um, but they do breed sort of in the sort of the valleys really that go from where I am in Gloucestershire all the way up towards the sort of the Midlands and beyond. The avocets might well be seen at gravel pits, particularly passing through a migration. And the oyster catchers, I've seen them at um, uh, Brandon Marsh, for example, nesting actually on some of the little islands at Brandon Marsh. So you will see those inland, even though you'll see them equally at home on sandy beaches um, on an estuary or around the seaside. Ah, oh, so here we go. This is what you're often presented with, I imagine. You suddenly see all these little grey blobs and grey jobs and you think, well, what are they? Well, I haven't, you know, in the time that we've got really, I, I just want to sort of give you a little bit of an inkling. The key thing really is, well, one, of course, they're often moving around. Two, they're often quite a distance away. So really, it's about going back to some of those key criteria we talked about at the start. And it's looking for key things about these birds. Time of the year, the habitat, looking for colours and size and beak shapes and all sorts of things like that. So some of these we can ignore, for example, the, the, these kind of bottom left hand ones. Um, if I just show with the... With, with the cursor. These are ones that will pass through places like Brandon Marsh and the Tame Valley. We've got a green shank here, a red shank, a rough and a common sandpiper. They're often along rivers. But actually the ones that are going to be most striking, perhaps most obvious, are things like this one here. This is the lapwing. This one here with the long straight beak. This is the black-tailed godwit. 
the oyster catcher, the ringed plover, and another a similar bird called the little ring plover and the avocet. So I think sometimes it's realizing that although a lot of these wading birds can be found across the web midlands, there are ones that are going to be most obvious and most striking. So if you go, for example, to somewhere like Brandon Marsh, you're going to most likely see a lapwing, an oyster catcher, maybe a ring plover and a black-tailed godwit. You might see some of these other ones maybe in July, August time on migration, but um, start with the kind of the bigger and the basic ones to start with first. If you go to the seaside, Again, you won't necessarily see all of these all at once, but if you do see big flocks of tiny little grey birds flying around, then they're probably going to be done in. That's our default kind of common bird that you'll often see flying around by the coastline. If you go to places like North Norfolk, then there's more of a mead. I always think done in a kind of more kind of starling size. And then the next one up, the knot uh, is difficult to tell really it's much more sort of blackbird size but their sizes are so difficult to tell from a distance but as i say i think for around the west midlands we're, we're dealing mainly with things like that wing oyster catcher and the godwits really and again it's going what we call this jizz it's the general impression shape and size it's how the bird's walking so a lap wing for example often does a little kind of walk and a stop walk and a stop um how so how are these birds feeding how are they flying um, all these different things, are they in a V formation, are they in a bunched flock? Um, so again, it's often looking at all these different kind of characteristics of a bird to work out what these actually, what they actually are. So here's our lap wings, for example, and they're often in a flock. And when they fly, they've often got these big kind of rounded wings. They're often very noisy uh, birds as well and very distinctive. And often they settle and then they go up in the air again. So they give you that kind of repeated opportunity to to see what they actually look like and are. And many people, particularly perhaps in sort of central Britain, or get often very confused by black-tailed godwits and bar-tailed godwits. Um, can anybody tell me which one you think is which, looking at these two here in flights? We've got the black-tailed godwits and the bar-tailed godwit. Which one's which? Yeah, absolutely, that's right. So the black-tailed godwit is the one on the top. Um, so there's two things here. First of all, the bar-tailed godwit is much more of a coastal bird. If you go to the North Norfolk coast, you might well see the bar-tailed godwit there feeding in the more sandy areas. If you go to the ex-estuary in Devon, uh, you'll get the bar-tailed godwit, sorry, the black-tailed godwit in the more muddier places near Topshin and the bar-tailed godwit more towards Exmouth where it's sandier. But actually, generally, at inland gravel pits and inland places, you're not going to get the bar-tailed godwit. You might sometimes get some on migration. Peregrines will sometimes eat them at urban locations in the middle of the country. But generally, your default godwit in small flocks or even sometimes big flocks in the Midlands is going to be your black-tailed godwit. So that, first of all, that's the kind of default anyway. Secondly, Godwits are never sitting still for very long, so usually they flap their wings, have a little flutter, fly around, and you genuinely notice black and white wings. Uh, don't worry about the legs so much, but it's the wings, it's the black and white wings, and bar tail godwits don't have that. There are other subtle things as well. Um, so there are legs, for example, the black tail godwit has longer legs and it has a longer bit of leg above the joint, whereas the bar tail godwit has a shorter bit. And I always think the bar tail godwit looks more curly like, much more streaky. And the bar tail godwit has a very subtly more upturned beak. But you know what? From a distance, you won't notice that. I would go on and just keep watching them and look for them fly. And even with the naked eye, you will usually notice those black and white wings. So that's a good tip there. Here's a bar tail godwit just feeding on, on the beach there. So hopefully just in that time there, it's just giving you, I didn't want to sort of overburden you with lots and lots of different wading birds there. I think the most obvious you're going to get are things like the godwits and the lapwings. And so those are really good birds to start with. And we've talked about the oyster catcher as well. So for those of you who struggle with wading birds, I would stick with going out over the coming months really and looking for wading birds, but look for those things like the lapwing, the godwits, and get confident with those ones first. And then if you see something a little bit different, you've got something to compare to, um, both size-wise perhaps, maybe what its behaviour, what it's doing, look for the beak, look for the colours, 
and you can gradually build up on what that bed might look like. And again, on the BTO videos, there are some nice comparison videos of Godwits and Sandpipers and Dunlins and things like that to help, which, which again extend the sort of learning that we're doing at the moment. So where, let me just go to the end here. So what I want to do is just spend the next sort of 10 minutes or so before we have some questions, just thinking about the next steps, uh, both in terms of resources, but also surveys. So let's just think about that. Firstly, there's lots of different fabulous bird guides out there. And where possible, try and get bird guide books which focus just on Britain. Because if you get the, the Collins Bird Guide's fabulous book, but it also covers every other bird you'll see across Europe and, and even sort of towards Russia way. If you go for one that's just Britain and Ireland, then you'll get just the birds you're most likely to see in this country. Um, the other thing is the bird ID videos, which I've just referred you to. So those are really good comparison videos of the most likely birds it is that you can get confused. Your doves, your pigeons, your corvids, your different wading birds, your different groups of wading birds, really. There's also um, the Nord University also has a really good online course. Um, the, the website down here, birdid.no, and you can register. And there's some really nice online progressive learning where you're learning about the birds with pictures and sounds and things like that. And you can go at your own pace. And um, I think it's free as well. I don't think you have to pay for it, but it's a really great way of sort of testing yourself on this website. So birdid.no is a really nice one if you want to sort of do something a bit more. And there are lots of apps out there as well. The top right one here is called Chirpomatic. You pay a little bit for it, but in essence, you can record the sound of the bird and it will give you a rating of what that bird is. And generally, it is a very good app um, with birds like great tits that can make lots and lots of different sorts of songs and sounds. Obviously, it can sometimes get a bit confused with those, but generally, if you play it, uh, if you record a black cap or a great tit or song, it, it will get it right. There's also the Collins Bird Guide, so that's the book version that you can actually download for, for a fee. The RSPB has an e-guide to British birds, which is free, which again gives you really nice profiles and illustrations and basic information about the birds. So there's lots of nice things out there like that. And the Cornell lab uh, called Merlin also has uh, the European, a European kind of ID app version where you can put in the color of the bird and characteristics about it. I think it also has the sound thing as well where you can, where you can record and, and it'll tell you what it is as well. And the Merlin's quite good because it also does birds in other countries. So when I was tour guiding in Mexico last year, I downloaded the Mexico version and um, was able to sort of show participants sort of Mexican birds and calls and sounds, which I wouldn't have had if I'd just taken my, my field guide. And the RSPB, rspb.org.uk, also have an identify a bird website where you can put in where you saw it, how big it was, what colour it was. Um, and it will give you matching birds that relate to the information you put in. So I put in here same size as a robin. And so it's brought up probably every every woodland or wetland bird you can imagine <laughs> is the size of a robin. But but you can go down by refining it by colour and where you saw it and things like that. So that's on the RSPB's Identify a Bird. Um, and what I'm going to do is just go to some different websites now. So let me just... Um, where should we start? Let's go up here. Oh, I just need to get rid of that. Uh, okay. So I've mentioned to you about the bird ID videos. There we go, which, um, which should be straightforward to, as I say, you can just type in BTO bird ID videos and uh, there's a whole variety of different ones down here, ducks, identify more hens, peregrines, the godwits, the female ducks, things like that. Lots and lots of different uh, ideas there. And if you go on to the BTO's sort of bird identification, the main web page there, there are some nice, again, sort of tips beyond what I'm giving you today. There's training courses, birding basics, survey essentials, so it just gives you some sort of further information beyond what I'm sort of giving you tonight, really. Um, it's going to bring it up. So it just gives you a bit more information about if you're going out doing a survey, the sorts of things to be aware of. So familiarising yourself with the survey methods, using a map or your knowledge of the area to check for hazards and things like that and what have you. So lots of nice things there. 
And what I want to do is to get to the survey pages. I might just do that a moment. There's also a really nice, so the Beto have also produced some really nice bird song basics videos on YouTube. So these actually complement some training courses the BTO do, but you can also use some standalone. So for those of you that struggle with bird sounds and want a bit more tuition, um, and again, I can't do all the birds just in an evening's webinar. If you look up bird song basics on YouTube, these are BTO videos, and there's a really nice mindful minute there, which is actually just listening, just reflecting on bird song. But then there's also some really nice comparisons done by Nick Moran, who's the training officer, between things like the doves, the tits, the greenfinch, the goldfinch. So a lot of these are species I've talked about tonight. And what I really encourage you to do is to, is to watch some of these videos to reinforce some of the things I've been saying tonight, but also to get some extra new tips that, that Nick's, Nick's giving you there. He also gives you House Sparrow and Dunnock, for example, Dunnock and Wren. So lots of things I've covered tonight, you can go back over and there's some sort of bird quizzes in here as well, which again relate to the courses, but I think you can probably have a go at it as well. So survey wise, um, let me just bring that up bigger. So I've mentioned to you about the Wetland Bird Survey. So the Wetland Bird Survey, as I mentioned, there's lots of information. Again, if you look up Wetland Bird Survey BTO, there's lots of information about taking part. And what I encourage you to do is that if you're really interested in going to a wetland where you can actively record the birds and submit them, for example, as part of Wetland Bird Survey, go to the website and then go to find a vacant site. And if you click on that, it brings you up a map. And basically you can zoom in um, to the Midlands hopefully wherever the zoom is. I might just put in uh, zoom to region. So I'm just going to zoom into the West Midlands and what it does is it will show you all the ones that are circled in orange I think are ones that are already taken. Oh no they're not, no they're not. Hold on a minute, let me just just click on here. So you've got a little um, key on the left hand side here, very high priority, etc. And then if you click on the different water bodies and you should be able to zoom in, I just can't find my zoom at the moment. Oh, there we go. Um, you'll see that there's all sorts of different water bodies. And if you click on them, it'll give you a bit of information and it will tell you whether they are vacant or whether they um, are already taken and also um, whether there's permissions and stuff like that. So if there is a water body, even if it's just a small pond near where you live, um, if it's not on this map, you can actually contact your local um, wetland survey organiser to check whether you could do it anyway. Um, but as I say, on this map, you can find all these different water bodies and find out whether they're vacant. So this one here at Sutton Coldford isn't vacant, for example. Um, so it's a really good kind of interactive map for you being able to actually find out where somewhere might actually be be possible for you actually to do a, a wet and bird survey. And uh, hold on a minute, I'm just going to bring this down again because it just keeps on clicking on the uh, the top tab of the um, thing. There we go. So let's just go back a moment. Let me just make that a bit bigger. So again, if you go back to taking parts and scroll down, contact a local organiser, you can fill in your details there. And so if there is a particular water body that you're interested in, you can also contact them. So I did that here where I live. I found a particular lake and I, I can't remember if it was on the map or not, but I checked with the local organiser whether I could do it or not. And I do it. it. It only takes me 20 minutes and I've got a young family. So it's a perfect kind of lake to just kind of visit and do that with. Now, the other thing with the wetland bird report is that you can actually check out the latest data for where you live. So if you go to, if you look up wetland bird survey report online, brings you to this really nice portal, which hopefully you can see here. Let me just make this a little bit bigger. And you can do two things. You can either type in a location, like Brandon Marsh, here we go. And if you click on Brandon Marsh, it brings up all the species that are found at Brandon Marsh. And there's been a wetland bird survey at Brandon Marsh since 2017-18. And it gives you all the numbers and average numbers of the birds that are found at Brandon Marsh. So again, you can look up lots of different places um, to try and find those. Or you can choose a species. So if you're really curious to know, um, 
how, I don't know, teal duck, for example, are doing across the country or in the West Midlands, what this then does is it gives you all sorts of different locations on the left hand side and then it gives you these really awesome maps here. So we can see that annually um, till uh, have been going up in numbers over the years, a bit of fluctuating, probably to do with um, warmer and colder winters for example. So the really nice thing is that not only can you submit data online to the wetland bird survey you can then actually see what your data is doing and you can actually see how well our wetland birds are doing around the country so whoever uh, the person that really likes teal you can actually really explore and see how teal are doing both in the county but also nationally as well the other survey that um, you can do more in the springtime is the breeding bird survey and again, if you look up BBS, Breeding Bird Survey on the BTO's website, lots of information about that. In essence, you can choose a one kilometre square, um, often close to you. I've got a couple of squares that are within a few miles of where I live. And you basically do um, a kilometre in one direction across that square and a kilometre in another direction. There's a fabulous online map where you can actually plan your route. And then it's split up into 200 metre sections where you are then actually um, writing down birds that you hear and see within 25 metres, within a 25 to 50 metre buffer and then beyond 100 metres or so. And again, you can submit your details online using a special recording form. And the nice thing is that you can then also look at the latest results. So if you want to know how well blue tits are doing in Warwickshire or the West Midlands, you can go to latest results, you can go to trend graphs and Hopefully it'll come up in a second. I was just thinking about it. And then what you can do is you can type in your species. Let's put in blue tit. Let's put in uh, the West Midlands. And there we go. We can see these are the graphs that I was kind of showing you a little bit earlier. So if you want to see how well collared doves are doing, for example, in the West Midlands, again, we get this really interesting graph showing the numbers going down. Um, what about cormorants? Big black birds that we see on gravel pits, their numbers have been going up during the 90s and then levelling off in the noughties. So again, it's a really fabulous way, even if you don't do a breeding bird survey, it's a really great way of interacting with data and understanding how birds are doing in your region and in your part of the country. Now, something you can all do, bird track. So bird track is the British Trust for Ornithology's free and convenient way of basically putting bird records online. Now, I don't want to go away from this evening not mentioning, for example, the Warwickshire Biological Records Centre. Really important to mention them and the fact that they do take um, records of all different taxa. But I find for birds, particularly if you're recording 20 different birds on a walk, I don't always find the recording forms as easy to use. Whereas on Bird Track, it's an app you can have in your phone or you can do it online. And you can basically record anything. So you can do a roving record where you might just see a red kite over your house and you can record that as a casual record. Or if you're going for a walk, you can record all the birds you see and hear on your walk and put those in as a list. And those all feed into BTO, BTO monitoring data, particularly for species that might be difficult to record on a survey, like a lesser spotted woodpecker or a willow tip, for example, or birds that don't get detected so much on a survey. Um, so that's a really good thing to look up um, is, is bird track and the data from bird track does actually get fed down to a county level to local bird recorders. Um, I think the transition between getting that data then to local county biological records office is a bit more clunky but certainly the data you submit on bird track will come down to a county level to a warwickshire level to the county bird recorders this is my bird track online so on my app it's much more simple but it's showing you some of the recent things that i've submitted some of the places it gives you all sorts of trends and things like that so this, the, again it's a really lovely interactive site um, and on my phone it's just quite a basic kind of app where I can basically just, I don't know if you can see that very well there, but I'm able to just add records, put in the place and the date and then record the birds. It sort of does like predictive text where I start typing in blue and it'll bring up blue tits and things like that. So hopefully in a nutshell, that's given you, shown you really, there's lots of different ways in which you can actually interact with birds and get recording. And 
finally, I just want to finish off with bird sounds. I don't want to overwhelm you. The RSPB does a really good A to Z of birds. And if you look up, for example, blue tit, it will give you a little snippet of sound of a blue tit. And that is embedded from this website, Zeno Canto. And the good thing about Zeno Canto is that sometimes when you hear a bird like a great tit, it has maybe 20, 25, if not more, different repertoires and sounds. And if you're just listening to an app or something, it's only giving you one of those. Whereas if, for example, you go to Zeno Canto and you put in great tit, um, and sometimes you might need to put in European or find it, check its Latin name. But if you put in great tit, it will bring up pages and pages of song and calls of those birds. And so you can then click on the play sound and you can listen to the different sounds and songs of these different birds. So Zeno Canto is just a great way of, if you've heard something, you have an inkling of what it might be, you can then come home maybe look at it on the sort of simpler RSBB website, but then you can also go to Zenocanto to get that kind of extra layer, that extra kind of depth of sounds and songs and calls and things like that. So on that note, <laughs> lots and lots of things there. Hopefully, I hope that by, by, hopefully by now in the evening, um, I've given you lots of tips, but I hope also just shown you kind of lots of tools. And obviously Debbie had also sent you quite a lot of links, which, which again, beforehand were useful but you can also follow up with after today's um, webinar so i'll hand back to debbie and just see whether there's any any further questions or or things that people want to follow up with before we finish up i'll come there we go okay great um thanks very much ed that was really informative and really interesting i'm sure we all learn a lot um, and are enthused to go out and actually just uh, see them when we can uh, maybe lockdown restrictions. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, if you're going out tomorrow for your daily exercise, um, just listen, just simply be aware of bird sounds. Don't worry if you don't know what they are, just be aware of what's around you. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, what I've given you tonight are, you know, places to go to look up song ID comparisons, visual ID comparisons, places where you can listen to sound. So, hopefully you've got a nice toolkit of stuff there that you can tap into but equally sometimes just enjoy it and 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 you know sometimes it's just lovely at the moment at this time of year just listening to robin's song and just hearing them even if you can't see them it's lovely so does anyone have any questions for ed feel free just to unmute yourself and and uh, ask yeah or write it in the chat thanks everybody yeah. for for taking part both on the um the Padlet and also on chat, it worked really nicely and it was just really nice to get that interaction with everybody. So thanks for taking part. Anybody Hi, yeah. Caring to thanks oh, for Hi, hello. <laughs> I thought it was really interesting. Um, I've only just started like taking notice of birds and ducks and things, so I don't, um, I'm not great at identifying loads of them. Um, and one thing I noticed, I went around. Uh, Draycott Water the other day that the birds are quite far away so it's quite hard to like see what they are so yeah. I wonder if there was any like binoculars that you'd recommend that are sort of compact and not too expensive um, yeah absolutely I mean in terms of the binoculars it's quite good if you can to find an optic shop nearby sometimes nature reserves will have optics that you can try um, but it's definitely worth having a play you'd be amazed at how many if I just go back and share my screen, um, hold on a second. I just wanted to show you, um, I'll just bring it back up and go back here. I'm just gonna share my screen again, and I'm just gonna scroll down. Hopefully it's gonna show me what I want. Just bear with me a second, just finding the slide I want. There we go. Budget binoculars. Slideshow. Oh, current slide. So I did um, a number of years ago now, I did um, a couple of features for where well, I tested out binoculars for BBC Wildlife magazine. Um, I think this was about eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago now. I look very young there in the photograph. <laughs> um, and the ones that came out best actually were these ones on the bottom right. These were Celestrons and these were £127. So 
the, the thing I would say is that if you only pay 30 or 50 pounds for a pair of binoculars, you are not going to get very good optics. You're going to get very poor optics, very low light levels. You genuinely want binoculars like these ones that are eight times 42 or eight times 32. So this means eight times magnification. And then the 32 relates to the, um, the width, the, sorry, the diameter of the lens. Now, often the small ones you might get given by charities like the National Trust or you might get sort of very, very cheap. They only have um, a diameter of about 15 millimeters. So they let very light, little light in and they've got very poor optics. If you pay a little bit more, so somewhere between maybe 100 and 200 pounds, which I realize might still be a, a lot of money, but it's, as I say, if you look for maybe these Celestrons, they're much closer to the 100 pound mark, um, then I think you'll, 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 you've got the comfort. These are kind of much more factory duplicated ones in the sense that, that you know, they're not, they're not as specialized as the, the really kind of expensive ones. But actually, I, I quite like them. They've often got very comfortable eye cups. Um, they're often very easy to maneuver the, the, um, the focus wheel, for example. But I would really try a range of different binoculars, but be very, you know, if you have only got 70 pounds or 80 pounds to spend, then obviously you just want to maybe just, just try out some of those ones that are around that range. But, but I would definitely, where possible, try and go for, for eight times, if not, if you can't quite afford it, maybe seven times, but definitely eight times um, 32, 35 or 40 if you can. Um, but also do do try out different different binoculars where if you if you possibly can, is that helpful? Oh. Oh. We lost. Just wanted to check that that's answered the uh, answered her question. I can always uh, get back to her <laughs> with yeah. some of the information. I think she's dropped out. Oh dear. Um, anyway, well, hopefully for the rest of you, that's helpful as well. I think, uh, although binoculars aren't necessarily cheap, um, I just think that if if you spend closer to fifty pounds, you're wasting your money. It's better to save up or, or or you know try and save up some money to actually go just that little bit over a hundred pounds and go for something a little bit more expensive. But I was wowed by these Celestrons. They're a Canadian make, and I just they they beat binoculars that were were almost double their price. So I was very impressed with those when I did that. I mean, that was I did that about ten years ago. There's others on the market, I'm sure. All right, anybody else? Um, just following on from that, um, when I've sort of looked at binoculars before, I've got a pair. But when I've looked at upgrading, I've looked at second-hand ones. I yes. Just wondered if you had any tips of like what to be looking out for with second-hand ones in terms of condition, but also in terms of specs. Yeah, so again, I mean, again, in terms of um, if we start with spec, first of all, so again, you're looking at eight times something, um, you can't 10 times something's okay. I would say if you're doing more woodland bird watching and kind of per, park bird watching, eight times is better because it's got a wider field of view. If you're doing more sort of open water and open habitats, then 10 times can often be better because it's giving you a closer view. But in a woodland, it means you can't always find stuff so easily. You're looking really for cracks and stuff like that. Often it's quite useful is to turn the binoculars the other way around and look up the bigger ends. Rather than looking up the eye lens end, look up the other end because sometimes that's where you might be able to see if there's a crack or if there's if something's not quite right, um, you know, if, the, if, if, if they're not quite aligning. But also just test them out with each, with each eye. With binoculars, they usually have like a little dial on one of the eye lenses, which basically you can usually adjust for your weaker eye. So my weaker eye is my left eye. So what I do is I, I focus normally with my, my I, I use the focus wheel to focus with my right eye. And then I open my left eye and I turn this dial to just get the focus right for my left eye. So again, you just wanna have a little fiddle with those just to make sure that they, they're aligned. Often when binoculars get bashed around, some of those alignment bits misalign. And so what you're looking for is fuzziness or almost like rainbow edging where, where you can see a bit of rainbow. And that means that there's probably the lenses just aren't quite working properly. And that may not be a problem, but, but often when you get a rainbow around your view um, or, or you're just getting the eye, the, what you're seeing in each eye isn't quite lining up, then that probably just means they've been knocked a few times and things like that, really. But just general, general quality of them. 
quite often though quite often though bird watchers are often just replacing their binoculars just because they're going for an upgrade and so you can often get good very good quality ones um the older ones the classic kind of heavy kind of war like black coated ones that often come from uh, you know a few generations ago they, they can be okay some of those but they are often very old and very knocked around and they, they can sometimes be a nice first pair of binoculars so I, my first binoculars were these kind of older kind of like i don't know 1950s black binoculars but they were a good starter and then i sort of gradually upgraded from there really thanks for that ah brilliant okay <laughs> that's all right abigail yeah hopefully i gave you enough information there brilliant hi yeah Thank Hi. you very thank you very much for your talk. It was super informative. Um, I was just um, so we've got some bird. Well, we've got one bird feeder in the garden, and yeah. so I you said about how there is a disease going around with the finches. Um, I was just wondering how often um, you should wash out a bird feeder, and if there are any particular seeds I should put in it at this time of year for birds. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of us wash our bird feeders as often as they as we should, including myself. I tend to find when we've been having a lot of this wet weather, I tend to find that the bird food, even in the best bird feeders, gets clogged, cloggy and clogged up. And so, um, one, it stops the bird feed flowing through the bird feeder, but also it can start to go mouldy. So when we have these wet episodes like we've had recently, I would um, perhaps put less food in the bird container so it goes down more quickly um so that way you can you can keep sort of just just keep keeping on top of it the the worst times for kind of trichomoniasis tend to be i think more in sort of late winter when lots of birds are coming to the garden we might be starting to get some warmer temperatures when the parasite can multiply more and also perhaps in sort of late summer and and but really it's about keeping an eye on it i tend to find with my bird feeders you can see they starting to get mucky where the birds are feeding on seed particularly in this wet weather and it, and it gets very dirty and wet and you can see that the perches they're on get like dirty so i think it's um at this time of the year particularly when it's been wet like this i i would do it sort of maybe every few weeks or so um and then during the summertime if you've only got some bird a few birds visiting so you don't need to do it too often but certainly if you do see some birds looking unwell then you, the, the best advice is to remove your bird feeders for at least two weeks clean everything really properly let those all the kit dry out um, and then reintroduce your bird feeders slowly in terms of bird feed the it's more expensive but but less messy below the bird feeders and that is sunflower hearts but the cheaper version is sunflower seeds and the birds can easily just break those open they do live a bit more mess with the kernels Peanuts are still a good a good food to put out for the birds. They're loved by great spotted woodpeckers and nut hatches. And fat balls are still really popular as well. Fat balls are really popular with starlings in suburban areas, and um, and long-tailed tits love fat blocks and fat balls and things like that. So it kind of depends what you want to attract. What I would avoid though is pet shop bird food where. Uh, it's very cheap because what they've done is they've put corn wheat and broken up dog biscuits into a general bird mix. You're looking much more for sort of high energy bird mixes that contain millets and small seeds and sunflower seeds and uh, avoid those kind of classic kind of pet shop bird feed mixes that have got broken dog biscuit and, and corn wheat and sweet corn in it. Avoid those ones. You'll only attract pigeons <laughs> that way. Thank you. I think we've got some of the cheap food in it at the moment. Yeah, it's worth it's worth paying a little bit more. Um, again, if you pay a bit more, if you go through something like the RSPB, you, you're you're getting a guarantee that the food is coming from a reputable supplier. The wildlife trusts have their own farm, which also pr produce food that come from you know seed that hasn't been sprayed with chemicals. So again, the wildlife trust, the RSPB, you do pay a little bit more but you are getting that, that peace of mind that the seed the birds are eating hasn't been sprayed to death or hasn't sort of had um, like insecticides, I can't what it's called now, but neonicotinoids can sometimes be in the plant and then come out in the seed without it being sprayed. So you can also do, do it that route as well. Thank you. All right.